recording. Welcome back, everybody. Rose's rendering number 57. Joining me today, my no less charming, no less Joe, special guest <laughs> co-host, movie correspondent Joseph Matz. Of course, you can tell Joe Stanford is unfortunately not able to join us today, but as Andy Dwyer says, the show must go wrong. So I'm actually excited to have Joe here in the studio today, the, the virtual studio, as it were. We're going to be talking about Dune, um, a movie that Joe and I have both seen recently. Of course, it's still in theaters, doing quite well, despite whatever complaints Joe will have about it. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, I, I very much enjoyed it. But before we get to that, a few a few other things. Joe, I finally have discovered an answer to an age old question that many of us have. What is the worst movie to watch with your parents? <laughs> and I finally I'm, ex I'm excited to find I out finally I finally have the answer replacing patches of the Christ uh the actual <laughs> answer <laughs> the actual answer is a movie called Videodrome Videodrome is a movie about a person who runs an adult film channel who eventually gets roped into kind of a conspiracy theory to use television to control people and okay. um, all, all fun, all good plot, et cetera, et cetera. What makes it the perfect movie to watch with your parents is the brutal sadomasochism throughout the film. And of course, the abundance of nudity. So if you're looking for a movie to watch with your parents, that will- This is not the one. Yeah, this is not the one. Um, <laughs> have you seen that movie before? Have you seen I, it? I have not. I have not seen this movie. Okay, but you know the director Cronenberg. I think is his name. He's yes, I, I do know of Cronenberg, and that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> yes, yes. If you're looking for a man's abdominal cavity to turn into a vagina that then rips off someone's hand and transforms into a hand grenade, this is the movie for you. I was going to say, even if you don't really know Cronenberg, if you just watched Rick and Morty, there's the episode where. Morty wants the like love formula and it goes wrong and eventually it just turns everyone into terrible monsters that want to yeah. devour Morty. And uh, they refer to all the creatures as Cronenbergs. So that gives you <laughs> the idea of uh, what Cronenberg generally is doing in a lot of his films. Yes, no, this definitely lives up to that. Of course, it also stars uh, James Wood, which is always funny. I, I only knew James Woods from the family episode where uh, he, and, he and Peter become good friends. Um, yeah, great movie. I saw it last night and thought to myself, yeah, I'm really glad I'm watching this one alone. And certainly I'm glad that my mom and dad were not with me during the viewing. But uh, it's fun. Catch it on Peacock. Um, very good. All right, Joe, before we get into Dune, the real thing I wanted to talk about beforehand, it actually sets us up quite nicely for Dune. Because, of course, a very important topic in Dune is race. People who haven't seen Dune or are planning on seeing you or who have read the books, of course, know what I'm talking about. We, Joe and I, the other Joe, Joe Stanford, have kind of begun talking a little bit about the origins of totalitarianism written by Hannah Arendt. And she talks quite a great deal about the, the, the two premier ideologies that uh, were responsible for the uh, Stalinist regime and the Hitler regime. And basically, they fall into two categories. The Hitler's regime was a race worldview, whereas Stalin's was a class warfare worldview. Um, what made these things so dangerous was that they took the form of an ideology. And so I wanted to give some characteristics of ideology um, that Hannah Arnett gives for ideology in the, in the realm of totalitarianism, and then um, basically explain why they're worse, why racism is worse than just a kind of bigotry. But it's something else. It's an ideology and, and kind of what that means. And there's basically three traits that I want to I want to give, quoting someone from the book, I'm not going to read the whole paragraph, but I'll give kind of the, 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 the broad brushstrokes so we can go from there. First, and this is again, ideological thinking and totalitarianism. So what, what elements do, do these ideologies have? First is their claim of total explanation. Ideologists have a tendency to explain not what is, but what becomes, what is born and passes away. They are in all cases concerned solely with the element of motion that is with history in the customary sense of the word. Second, 
In this capacity, ideological thinking becomes independent of all experience from which it cannot learn anything new, even if it is a question of something that has just come to pass. Hence, ideology or ideological thinking becomes emancipated from reality that we perceive with our five senses and, in, and insists on a truer reality concealed behind all perceivable things. And then third is that since they have, or since ideologists have no power to transform reality, they achieve this emancipation of thought from experience through certain methods of demonstration. Um, dot, 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 basically insisting on a, what ends up being a, a too rigid logical framework from the premises of the ideology through to whatever they need to explain. Um, how does this pertain to race and to racism? Well, when you can use, as, as Hitler did, um, his race theory to explain any and all things about the world, right. in, in a sense, closing himself off the new experience, closing the ideology up the new experience, if you would have tried to contradict something that he would say, he would say no, 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 that's part of the Jewish propaganda. Oh, right, this thing right. you have is wrong. No, 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 no. You're falling for, for the Bolshevik propaganda, which is actually just Jewish propaganda because the Jews are high on the whole, the whole thing. Um, this, this total explanation is, and, and this ability of always having a truer sense of reality where everything can be explained away through some kind of conspiracy. Um, or when I was reading that part, I found, you know, very frightening because there's a, there's a kind of comfort that we have with, with total comprehension. We like answers that are complete and this ability to always explain something I think is very pernicious. Um, and very much, and very much anti-scientific, because of course the whole point of science is always to be challenging our premises, never accepting them as, as you know, final, and then only right. moving on from there. It's always about challenging um, the premises. I have a few more things to say about that, but before I do, I'll give you a chance to kind of respond on on what I've said so far. No, I think that that just makes a lot of sense. Where when you become so involved in an ideology that it has to explain everything. That, that's always a dangerous road to go down. And even in, you know, less, obviously, you know, <laughs> less, uh, I got just evil <laughs> right. uses of this, where obviously, like, Stalin killed millions of his own people. Um, I guess Hitler did, too, when you really think about it. But, like, even if you look at just, like, some baseball... Oh, God, God, we dodged the uh, Holocaust revisionism, right? <laughs> No, I'm kidding. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that's something people forget sometimes when you talk about Hitler. Is that it's like, oh, like some you'll get those people who are like, well, he did good stuff for Germany. It's like, well, actually, a lot of Jews were German. So right. no, unless you're just <laughs> thinking along the same lines as Hitler, no, he was bad well, for Germany. Not only but, that, uh, but he also killed a lot of German non-Jews because they were yeah. undesirable. You know, life not worthy of life was the phrase they used for. I think the. Um, handicapped people in whatever capacity yeah, there, there were there were levels and unless you're at the top level you didn't want to be on the list at all <laughs> um but yeah i think it's a, a dangerous thing in any kind of politics or even like i think th th this is just me i'm not trying to like put any specific focus on this group but just when i think about like sometimes with like people on the left in the u.s or like bernie sanders people who are people i personally generally agree with on a lot of things Sometimes they're so overly focused on the class aspect of money and politics that you ignore other factors that matter in the world in politics. And so I think, you know, even if it's not driving you towards this agenda of like people who don't agree with me should die, there's right. still anytime you try to devolve everything into, oh, this one thing is what matters, class is what matters, or race or whatever, even if it doesn't lead you down the most dangerous path, it's still not a good path. It will, yeah, and that, and that's a great a great point too about being on a path is in in a sense also what makes them dangerous because inherent in all of these things is, is a kind of finality the idea of having the last word, which yeah. invokes a kind of sense of destiny, which I think is probably mm. all the kind of grand human ideas. I think destiny is maybe the most dangerous because if if, if something seems inevitable, then whatever you do to get there, in some sense, is justified because justified, you're going to get yeah. there anyways. So with, with regards to, to, to Hitler and with, with race thinking, it, 
we we are going to be in a race war. This is Hitler's mindset. It's actually right. even broader than just the Jewish question because it was it, the, the Jews weren't the only other race. In fact, like, were, like like you mentioned, yeah, there's like a lot. Like if you look at anyone in Eastern Europe, he's kind of like, yeah, they can die. They don't matter. You're exactly right. And and only not only that, but it's natural because we're in we're in a competition for the finite resources of the world. This goes back to our conversation to us about sum. Yeah. the danger of zero sum mentality. All this plays in with, with Hitler's broad race war agenda. And you know, Hitler or Stalin take out race, put in class, the exact same argument goes through. Um the the um problem with these things, of course, the total explanation, emancipation from reality by always having something conspiratorial, you know, to explain away whatever they can incorporate. Um, and then that last, and then that that third part, this idea of, of only using deduction to predict all of the world around you, um, closing you off to, in a sense, the liberation of scientific thinking by being willing to challenge the things that you think are true um, is such a clear distinction between an open society in a totalitarian one. I mean, yeah. that is the definition. An open society has nothing it's not willing to question to talk about and believes enough in its principles that's willing to talk about and challenge its principles. That is the hallmark of an open society. Totalitarian ideology is the opposite of it. And Hannah Arden makes this point too in, in the book, class and race are not the only ideologies that exist. There were reasons why those became the prominent ideologies in Europe at the time. But those were in some sense circumstantial. It, it, it need not have been that we only can be driven to extremes by race or with class. Other Definitely things, religion, as we've seen. But, absolutely. But I think in, in the large part, you're seeing those two replaced religion over time as kind of like our major dividing forces. Well, in, in, in some sense, I think that's tied very much to a sense of destiny that if your religion no longer has a destiny for you, then maybe your race does or something. It, it mm -hmm. kind of, or maybe your class. A search does. for that in some aspect of your life. Which is which is a, a big part of Hannah Arnott's work when she talks about what defines people as being in the masses and this, and this concept of loneliness driving people to look for some kind of group to be a part of. And that brings me to my problem with the film, Idiocracy, Ooh. not with this. Yes. Now, I'm not the only person to say this about idiocracy. It's a point about the film that I, I agree with. And basically, I'll, I'll summarize my problem with idiocracy like this. If you put a theater with 100 seats and you put 50 Republicans in it and 50 Democrats in it, both groups would walk out of the theater thinking that the movie was making fun of the other people. Everybody thinks that they're in on the joke. When it comes mm. to idiocracy, everyone thinks they're the ones that get it. Like, oh, yeah, they're the dumb ones. OK, well, it's making fun of somebody. So who is it? And I I, <laughs> I mean, that's my problem with it is that everybody thinks that they're kind of on the in group. And um, I mean, in, in, in some aspect, you could say that's a, that's a plus for the movie. <sighs> I think it's a negative, and and, he, and, 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 and let me let me and yeah, it's it's a plus for trying to sell tickets. I think it's I think it's negative in a in a, in a social aspect because I think it it drives people to see themselves as being part of the enlightened group, and that to me is what's is what's frightening that mm -hmm. they're that they're part of the enlightened group that knows how things really are, and in that I I think there's there, there's that creeping kind of drive at no longer looking for the truth but being more concerned with persuading other people to agree with you that is what bothers me about idiocracy that it kind of drives people to think that they're part of the enlightened group and that they they have the truth and that they're going to go out there and convince people of it i'm, I'm probably reading too much into it but i I've, I've been really bothered by that and um yeah, you are reading a lot into a movie that starts out making a uh fud ruckers butt fuckers joke so well, I'm also a fun worker. <laughs> Maybe I took it too personally. No. Um, basically, let me let me say this. Let me say this. Let me let me know this part, and then I'll give it over to you. I I am most fearful of savior politics. The idea of trying mm. to convince people to vote for you by positioning yourself as the savior of the country. That right. The only solution me. to get us out of whatever terrible yes. thing is happening. And and that is maybe the thing that is most shared by the political parties today is that message, vote for me or else. And I think that I, that, that to me is frightening. Um, and uh, 
that kind of see an idiocracy, maybe somewhat like the seedlings of that, is it of, of putting people in the position of enlightenment um, makes me makes me somewhat fearful. I've said a lot on this. Let me give it over to you and then we'll move on to Dune. Um, yeah, just, <laughs> just to add to that last point. I mean, I think, you know, you do, there's definitely a clear like vote for us. Otherwise the other guys will do this. That's, I mean, it always exists to some degree, but it seems like it's especially permeated our politics over the last 10 or so years. Um, I, I will say, and I, you know, full disclosure for anyone who doesn't know me, I, you know, my bias would obviously be, you know, towards people on the left. <gasps> but, I, you know, I do think when you look at that, there, I see more danger on the right in part because it, right now, anyway, it's a, a lot of it's a cult of personality as well. Which, which I think is an into, ad- the, into the savior narrative. Yeah, which I think adds I into that know. danger where like, you know, I know it was like a Daily Show bit where they went to a Trump rally and the guy was interviewing some woman and he was like, so it's not a cult, right? And she's like, yeah, it's not a cult. He's like, well, what do you like about what Trump says? And she's like, oh, he, I like anything he says. He can say whatever and I'm on board. And right. obviously, you know, you interview however many people and you use that. Right. One you find the one that you get right. 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 So, I, I, you know, I don't want to paint too broad of a brush, but there's clear cults of personality that definitely does not exist around Joe Biden. Like, <laughs> you talk to, like, pretty much <laughs> anyone who voted for Joe Biden, and the feeling isn't like, I would, I'm would. i on board for anything. He no, I, I think, I, I let, let me say this, as uh, I, I will say this, and I, I mean this in, in as a political way as possible, I think the best thing that Joe Biden has going for him is that no one really likes him that much. That's probably his like most yeah, like just, quality as a candidate. <laughs> right. That no one for me, like, like in terms of what I worry about, which is this kind of movement of like, oh, it's all it yeah. has to be. It's like the guy who's kind of like, oh, all right. Like to me, that's it, it, in, in some sense a very healthy sign of politics in some way. Like as, as absurd as it was, because I remember right around 08, you'd hear like the random like someone on the right was saying that like Obama was going to be the Antichrist or something. Right. And that was obviously yeah. absurd for a million reasons. But you could at least get on board with like the potential for a cult of personality there. Yes. Where it's like, which exists for Trump and definitely does not exist for Biden. And no. I mean, the only person on the left who would exist for in any degree would be Bernie right now. And he's 80 years old. So right. I'm not, yeah. not no, terribly worried the about anything going off the rails there. Yes. No, I, I think I think that's all that's all well said. Because, um, yeah, I mean, you look at Hitler and Stalin and obviously especially with hitler because obviously communism and stuff starts with lenin so it's not just a stalin cult of personality thing but hitler very much so and then you know look at like mao in china when communists first came to power there where you have like the cultural revolution which in part is driven by the cult of personality that this guy is the one saving us we have to do whatever he says all well said all well said um let me, I'm checking things off my list here. Yes, I'm, I, so for people who are more maybe curious about this kind of on the book itself, I have read it. I'm kind of going through it again as we're doing these little segments on it. Highly recommend it. Um, because if anything, it actually explains that these phenomena are complicated. There's not a one or two word answer for what allows a thing like Nazi ideology to take over Germany. You can't put right. that in a paragraph. It doesn't fit. The, the same thing is true with communism in, in Russia. It wasn't like, oh, the czars were bad and therefore, no. It's complicated. It takes a lot to work out, a lot of moving pieces. Even this book probably doesn't cover all of it because that's the nature of history. It's always very complicated. And um, I, think, I think that in and of itself is a good message, that, that, that it takes you know, 500 pages to explain a thing that for most of us is covered and maybe a couple of weeks of history class tells you these things are complicated and don't have simple answers. And that is a lesson in and of itself worth understanding as they rebuttal yeah. to the framework of looking for ideologies that have total explanatory power. And maybe that, that would be maybe the, the meta point of the book in some sense. Yeah, I mean, one, one thing I always try to tell people anytime you're talking about politics is never vote based on something you could put on a bumper sticker. Right. Yes, you're looking like, for at least a pamphlet. <laughs> the pamphlet, yeah, like, and I think that, that that was interesting that you made the point that the book itself probably doesn't cover everything. And yeah, when you contrast that with the ideologies that we're talking about, where sometimes they are trying to dilute everything down to a very simple 
it's this or it's that. Right. Right. The world race wars are natural. Therefore, you know, whatever class war is natural, therefore, whatever. And then everything falls out from there. Look out, look out for the wrong kind of simplicity, which is, which is a simplicity that never challenges its premises. That's Mm -hmm. how you identify um, the wrong kind of simplicity as opposed to elegance, which has its own right. And and the thing is on value in a scientific framework. And the thing I, I think people should always remember, and it could be in regards to politics, faith, whatever, if whatever you believe in, if you're so afraid it'll fall down that you won't challenge it, then it's probably not worth believing in in the first place. Yes, I agree. I agree. Unless you're talking about how Dune is the best movie of 2021. In which case... <laughs> well, that's why we're, we're going to dig in and we're going to find out. Yes, no, we are. We are. Very good. Read Hannah Arden. I, Hannah Arden, I recommend the book. It's very, very good. I actually bought a second book from her, actually called On Violence, a much shorter book um that i that i also have enjoyed um we'll continue talking about the book throughout the next few episodes um not trying to do anything in a in a chronological order or even in order in the book basically trying to extract lessons from it um and uh you know fill time on this podcast no okay (laughs) um let's move on to dune now i have a lot to say about dune i bet you do I'm excited because, yeah, just to get it out there for everyone, I have no previous relationship to Dune, whereas you do. And so I think that yes. will bridge the two perspectives here. Yes, I'm excited for this. I, I have, when I say read, I have not read Dune. I have listened to the audiobook, So that's already a, a mark against me in terms of the, <laughs> in terms of the uh, Dune fandom that exists. Um, I quite like the first Dune book. The second one was still okay, and I don't know if I finished the third one. I don't. Think From I'm my gonna... understanding, having now learned more about <laughs> Dune over the last month or so, is that that is the general consensus: is that the first book is really good, and yeah. obviously it's inspired a million things, including Star Wars. And then the stuff after that, people, some people are into, some people yeah. are not as much. Yeah, it's um, it's. Well, let me just uh, a quick word on the book. I want to. I want our conversation really to focus kind of on the movie yeah. as a standalone experience, which I think mm-hmm. will be the predominant way that people experience it, which is yeah. by itself. Um, anybody, whether you're J.R.R. Tolkien, whether you're Frank Abair, whether you're C.S. Lewis, whether you're anybody who can write a book that doesn't just create a character, but creates a whole world is impressive to me. Um, the amount of imaginative power that it takes to create something on that scale is to me very impressive. And certainly Dune fits in the category of book that does that very well. I think even if you hate Dune as a message, you would agree with its ability to to create scope and scale. Right, the world building within the- Yes, which is always impressive. So I'll say that about the book, just if if you enjoy that kind of book experience, you will will certainly enjoy Dune. Okay, why don't you go first? Tell me what you thought about the movie. It's spoiler alerts because we're gonna. It's, it's only the the movie only gets halfway through the first book, so it, which is definitely definitely something people should know going in. I knew that going in, and yeah. I still found the ending a little bit jarring. Yes, and, and, so, and it is. it's very abrupt. So yeah, if, if someone goes in having no idea, I don't even know how you would react to that. But yeah. which 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 is impressive given how long the movie is. It's like a three hour movie. Yeah. It's only half of the book. So. Um, of oh, the first book and there's like at least three books and then there's like even more than that i, I don't really forget how many books yeah i don't know the total number but i think it is a pretty large and i believe his like son and other well that, right yes in this universe but yeah for the film itself um i know i was super excited for this regardless of again like i don't have a pre-existing thing with dune but uh denny villeneuve the director is one of the best directors working today um i'm sh- most people should have seen at least one of his movies sicario prisoners arrival which we've discussed previously on this podcast uh, blade runner 2049 so i mean he's he's kind of gone from doing the uh, the sequel to a beloved sci-fi classic to doing his own version of kind of a sci-fi misfire from the 80s <laughs> like yeah i never want to think about doing again after yeah. that 80s film so i yeah i was super hyped for this um 
Hans Zimmer, who did the score, which is fantastic work, Hans Zimmer, should surprise no one. He passed up working on Tenet, which no one wanted to do this movie. So that tells you just the general hype within the film industry. Um, I think yeah yeah sorry everybody a little internet trouble there joe you had just kind of gave us an idea obviously denis villeneuve has made probably i would say everybody's probably seen the second blade runner certainly arrival is a classic um Sicario. Sicario classic. So yeah. So yeah. So from, from there, uh, going into now making June, the misfire of the 1980s movie, which is putting in generously, I would say. But. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, David Lynch did the, uh, 19, uh, early to mid eighties Dune, which I think even David Lynch isn't a huge fan of, as far as I understand. And uh, one big difference what we already alluded to is that Lynch decided to film the entire story into one movie. And I think it still came in shorter than this movie. Whereas Villeneuve decided, we're doing this in two different movies. I want to cover everything. And he said that he's not trying to do a correction on the other movie. He's just doing, this is my adaptation of the book. That is his aim here. Um, so far as the adaptation goes, I think one great thing about it is this cast is incredible. Um, I think Timothy Chalamet is perfect for uh, the role of Paul Atreides, who's the lead character in this movie. Because Chalamet, the very first thing I ever saw Timothy Chalamet in was Homeland. And he was the like villainous vice president, spoiled son who does a hit and run. And I feel like you can always kind of see that in Timothy Chalamet, where you can imagine this like kind of spoiled piece of shit. But then he also, he's a charismatic actor. I know someone I talked to mentioned that he has like some young Leo qualities from like the mid 90s, like through Titanic type Leo performances and i see that too and i think that makes it perfect for like the son of a powerful rich guy who might be a savior person like we're kind of on board with him but we're also like do i want this guy to be the savior and i think he's having that own battle in his mind at the same time and i think that really informs it well um rebecca ferguson is the his mother in this she's also part of the You'll have to correct me on probably my pronunciation here, but uh, the Ben Jesuit, the Benny Jesuit, Benny Benny Jesuit, Benny Jesuit, who are kind of like, well, this is one of my favorite things is there's just like this shadowy group of yes, women manipulating stuff, and they also have like semi magical powers. And so she's his mother, and she's also just fantastic in everything. Um, Mission Impossible movies, which we've also discussed. She is fantastic. Oscar Isaac, always love Oscar Isaac as the dad. It's really just stacked with people and they're all doing their roles perfectly. Isaac's kind of, you know, the powerful guy trying to do the right thing where they're sent. Well, I guess, let me just give a brief plot summary. So there's these various houses throughout the universe and they're all semi-competing, but though there's an emperor who rules everything. And on this one desert planet, there's a spice that allows for like interplanetary travel. It's the key to that. And so this one group has been mining it from that planet and they've been really abusive to the people living on it. And now the emperor's told them they've got a bail. House Atreides is coming. They're in charge now. But it's clear to everyone, well, almost everyone involved seems to realize this isn't actually like the emperor being like, showing favor to Atreides. It's actually him trying to fuck them up in a certain way. And it's just a question for Atre- the Atreides family of how far the Emperor is willing to go on that and whether or not they can harness the power of this planet and become allies with the native people there to then potentially challenge the Emperor. And so that's kind of the setup for the whole thing. And then, yeah, so you've got Shalome, Ferguson, Isaac. They're the, all the Atreides people. You got Josh Brolin and, uh, shoot, why am I blanking on his name? Uh, Jason Momoa yeah. are kind of like the two badass guys who are on their side. And then you got Stellan Skarsgård as this creepy Baron guy who's, I believe Villeneuve described him as wanting to be like a human rhino. 
<laughs> that's yeah. why basically Stone Skarsgård had to spend like seven hours getting prosthetic stuff put on him and then Dave Bautista is his number two so they're the bad guys and then the uh the native people who I was expecting to see more of in this movie yeah based on posters <laughs> like if you're if you're just if anyone happens to be going to this movie because they're a big Zendaya fan check your expectations <laughs> but uh javier bardem shows up and it, the great scene where he uh spits in right. his greeting to oscar isaac's kind of like king type guy and it's actually a sign of respect because they're on a desert planet and so it's like water is such a valuable resource which a great example of like the world building within this universe yes. is that you have little things like that that tell you like this is a well thought out thing um, so beyond the casting, and again, I think everyone does well here. It's good performances all around. Um, Villeneuve, the visuals are first rate. Uh, again, if you've seen Arrival, Sicario, Blade Runner, this should not be a surprise. The uh, I have not seen the 80s Dune, so I do not know what the sandworms looked like in that movie. But uh, I've got a feeling it pales in comparison to the uh, sandworms in this one, which are visually stunning um, we get some up close looks at uh the sandworms eventually and uh it's a horrifying idea to be eaten by a sandworm so that's fun my overall my big issue with this movie ultimately is it almost just feels like a prologue to the main story yeah yeah, yeah. and i do wonder if there's another way of structuring it where it doesn't feel quite like that like you said, now I'm going to get into the real spoilers. So definitely stop listening if you haven't seen it. Again, it's on HBO still, I believe, streaming. But, so you can watch but it. But be sure to follow us on Twitter and Instagram before you <laughs> <laughs> But I, I would also say, again, the visuals, see this in theaters. Uh, you know, Assuming you can do it safely, you're vaccinated, go see it in theaters because yes. unless you have like a 65-inch Ultra HD TV, you're not going to do this. Justice. Plus, let me also add too. You mentioned Hans Zimmer, but the sound yeah. quality is, is equal to the visual. I mean, you, it's yeah. you feel your chair rumbling. With, yeah, this is a movie I mean, where you you experience this movie. Yeah. yeah, you're not just sitting there and seeing a little story being told. You experience this whole thing. Right, right. And just so, like, just like in Along Came Polly, <laughs> very similar movies. <laughs> a lot of sharding in this one. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah so my main issue is yeah it feels kind of like a prologue i do yeah. wonder if maybe there's a way where you delve more into the politics of this world which granted maybe that's not the way if you're trying to get another movie filmed because you haven't actually gotten the money yet right but me personally i would have liked to see more of like understanding our why does the emperor not like house of Trades, like how do all these different things interconnect and then you end on the fall of House of Atreides, where they get betrayed, they get wiped out, and then you just kind of like end it on Paul and Lady Jessica in the desert, and like they're like leaving, they're like leaving their little pod, and then that's where you end the movie. Because structurally, that just makes more sense to me as a film, where it's kind of like we get the big action, and then now where like you get the idea of what comes next whereas this one they spend a lot of time in that desert well and it, uh, it just feels bizarre because it's like this movie is peaked action wise and now we're just spending time with primarily just two characters wandering in the desert and then you know it obviously it has its own way of you know now he's jo they've joined in with the desert people i'm forget what are the desert people what's their name Fremen, very creative name, the but Fremen. yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> that was, yeah, not the most creative part of the story. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, now they've joined up with the Fremen. And, you know, that has its own kind of like now, I mean, Zendaya even like looks back and says like, this is only the beginning, which I just laughed at. I was kind right, of, yeah, it's been three hours. So. <laughs> pretty, yeah. pretty, pretty cheeky uh, little end line there. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I, I almost wonder, I, again, I don't know how this story ends so maybe this wouldn't make sense but i almost wonder if it would have been better as a trilogy where you dig in more to that then you're having kind of this desert storyline and i'm assuming there's more but i don't know if that doesn't happen until book two because obviously there's this is building up to like a challenging of the emperor type deal yes which maybe well, doesn't happen in the first story which i don't know well 
let me without without giving too much away it certainly certainly resolutions happen with the emperor in first book and okay. will it will happen in the next movie now, i'm not giving anything away when i say that because you, in fact you kind of see that in a vision that paul has in the movie as well that kind of that fight taking place um i so this is interesting so i was telling my telling my wife one of the things i really enjoyed about the book and that i really enjoyed about the movie is the way concepts within the world are introduced to the reader and i'll give an example of one i think with a game that i can play with you after having seen the movie can you explain why spice is actually important you kind of mentioned what it was used for but can you actually explain right. why right why they don't, they don't delve into like, right it's not like oh we use the spice and right. then we ground that down and that goes into this machine and like no we don't know that right. but yeah you get the bare minimum that you need to know. And yes, that, that is a good example of, we don't really need to know more there. Like that's <laughs> fine as is, I think anyway. Well, and I, I, I think it, 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 I was telling my wife, what I like about it is that Dune very much, and I, Frank Aber, and I'm glad to see uh, the director kind of caring with the same um, uh, perspective on storytelling is that there, there's almost an immersive quality to it that yes. anybody who's ever taken like a second language class the, sometimes the teacher tells you what a word means and then you use it that's one way of doing it mm -hmm. the other is just to start using the word and then you kind of gradually learn through right. use what the word right. actually just, just kind of throw people in yeah and so i'm going to fix my bad lighting real quick for the podcast All right, good. Back, oh, I actually can see that having to like dodge. I don't know. Down I like your striped look there, Julie. Yeah. Um, look at how pale I look. Oh, another another episode, perhaps. But yeah, so so definitely this belief in immersion, where it's okay, you have spice, but what's spice used for? It, it they don't really explain. It. It's used for interplanetary travel. How is it fuel for the ship? Or is it something else? Hit spoiler: It's actually something else. Let me ask you another oh, question. Interesting. Were you? Were you surprised at the almost complete lack of robots in the film? Did you notice that there weren't that many? Yes, and the, and the lack of guns, really. Lack well. of guns, lack of robots. Real Which I, I've learned some of the background now on the lack yeah. of robots. But yeah, I would not have yeah. known that having only watched the movie. Right. Nor, nor would you have known that when you're reading the book, that these things come out gradually as well. Um, there are some other good ones as well. Like you mentioned, why do they use swords instead of guns, you know, so on and so forth. So there's, there's an immersive quality to the storytelling that in my, in my mind makes it richer, but it can also be frustrating because you're, you, when you're reading the book or when you're watching the movie, you're going like, yeah. well, what the hell is going on? Does it matter? <laughs> like, what? <laughs> I don't know. Sure. Um, it, it, in, in a way, this is kind of, it's, it's definitely a political thriller because you are trying to understand, you know, what are the different power dynamics here um, between the different houses. It's unclear what the real structure is. You have an emperor, but then you have these different houses, and then you have... Right, the and we only get a, and, a feel for House Atreides, and I forgot to mention, House Harkonnen is the bad guys. In yes. This. But yeah, I mean, I I don't think... The movie ever explicitly says like the number of other houses there are there's allusions to other houses but it's like the, well only watching this movie you know there's these two houses but are there three others are there to those other ones outside of the relation yes no i i, I agree there's it, it leaves a lot open-ended for sure All right. All right, everybody. Uh, <laughs> yes, we're back again. Um, House of Trades. Yes. No, yes. Basically, wrapping up the point on, on this, the author and the director both decide to leave a lot out for just pure exposition. There's a lot of just right. throwing things at you and kind of sinking you in with it. And to me, that kind of adds to the immersive experience of it and also the scale that there's just too much to explain to people. Um, so you have to rely on, on these other methods, basically.
Great internet here at my house today. Uh, apologize for what will inevitably be. Uh, this will be an interesting upload. I have no idea what will come of it. Um, okay. <laughs> Real quick before I get kicked off again. Um, yes. Yes. Exposition. They don't believe in it. They don't do a lot of it. It's a lot of just throwing things at you, et cetera, et cetera. And, I mean, do you generally prefer that? How did you? I mean, well, obviously, it's different for you. Well, I guess you experienced it with the book, so yeah. you can relate to how the rest of us felt with the movie. I I tend to not like that because I like to – I'm I. I'm not a fan of people kind of taking what they want from art, this kind of like idea of any interpretation is valid. I like to know what the answer okay, is. Okay, you just want it more clear to exactly what's going on. Yes. And so okay. I don't mind if that explanation comes later on, yeah. but I like it to eventually make its way to us. Now in Dune, that does happen. Eventually they okay. do explain how these things come about. Um, so I like it in Dune. I would be upset if they never, ever covered it and kind of just, oh, it's up to the reader to imagine that. No. That, that's not so much what happens in Dune. This is not given to you in a linear fashion. So it has an immersive feel to it. Um, so I, I actually enjoyed that quite a bit. Um, talked about the cinematography. It's a master class of cinematography. Yes. Uh, scenery, background, everything. I don't know what I would improve on it. I mean, it felt visually stunning to me in almost every shot. It seemed to capture the scale of, you know, how big things were. Yes. Uh, everything felt immense um, and rich and detailed. And I really enjoyed that as well. Yeah, th this is one of those movies where it's going to get nominated for 10 Oscars at minimum because every like technical Oscar, it's going to be up like special effects, cinematography, um, s sound. I forget if they combine the sound categories now, but like you said, it's immersive, not just visually, but also from a sound perspective as well. Um, I do generally like how it drops us in and doesn't over explain things. I think they generally, they give us enough. Um, you know, you get a couple of scenes where Paul, which again is the main character, Timothy Chalamet, where he's watching like these kind of educational videos right. before they go to Arrakis, which is the planet where he's like learning about, you know, this is how the Freeman walk to avoid the sandworms and so we were able to kind of learn that with him and it doesn't feel like you know like some movies they're just like they're overly explaining it or it's super awkward the way that they like have someone use some exposition to tell us whereas us learning it with him i feel like it's a more ah, what's the word it's just more of a way that feels natural to the yeah. film to yeah. storytelling and so I appreciated that. And yeah, it doesn't feel like it's trying to dumb itself down for anyone. Right. Like, we are supposed to be able to read into like certain relationships within this film without huge explanation. And I appreciate that. Like I yes. said, for me, my, my main issue with it is it just feels incomplete. Right. And, and, and I did, like, again, I understood going in, I was only getting half of this story. Yeah. But I... I'll, I'll, when I think back and I remember like the fellowship of the ring obviously you get to the end of that movie and I mean there's still six hours left of this story <laughs> six that feels, you know, and, that's like the uh, theater version there's like eight you know, all this yeah, right? but yeah. like that feels like a very much they told a story that's complete to this film yes or even something that's a little in between the two where you get to like Matrix Reloaded Right, right. That movie still feels like a more of a complete film than this one does to me. And I think part of it, yeah. again, is the way it's structured where it kind of climaxes with an hour left in the movie or 45 right. minutes, whatever it is. And then it continues on. And then it just seems to end in the middle of that. Yes. And so I think that just made it awkward for me. Um, so yeah, if I was giving this a grade, it would probably be a B, but it's more <laughs> of an incomplete because... I could easily, I could watch part two and be like, oh, now that I have these as a whole, this is like an A minus yeah. or something. I don't, B is probably about as low as it can go, I would say. It's, I'm assuming I'll feel better about this on rewatch and especially once I have the second film. Yes. But it, like I said, it, it's a fantastic job of world, world building. But yeah, it's just hard for me to shake that it's just like, I don't feel like I got a complete movie here. No, and I, I was telling one of my friends, I was like, I almost wish that they had gone the Game of Thrones route with making this. 
where it's like a series of one hour installments or something and you have like eight hours right. it could just be one huge like hbo mini series event like 10 hours or something yeah that that's what i would have liked as well um and it did and i i actually did not know that the that the movie only went to half of the film when i oh, saw really it in and so i was watching it and it was like i looked at my watch i was like you're like two hours yeah. was like, you're like am i gonna nowhere, be here for five more hours like, yeah, it's like nowhere near where the book is and i realized like oh they're gonna end it soon and yeah. um and uh so i was actually surprised by that now for me because i know how it ends that didn't feel you know in a way i was kind of like well i'll have to make a second one now so it's fine but yeah. um yeah, as a standalone, it will it definitely will leave you wanting more, which is both good and bad. It's bad in the sense yeah. that it gives you something incomplete. It's good in that it, you watch you wanted to see what, what's going to happen with these characters. Um, what did you think of the plot? Um, I, I generally liked where the story seemed to be going in a lot of those ways. I, you know, I, I'm definitely a fan of, you know, the giant politics and the scheming that goes off you know i loved most of game of thrones like most people right um yeah i i enjoy that type of story and i think you know there's doing it's doing very interesting things where you're mixing that with you know obviously you have a savior storyline going on here um but i think it, it does a good job of combining all these things in a way where even now after we've had things that have been inspired by dune it still feels pretty fresh yeah, it doesn't it doesn't feel like, oh, I've seen this before. Like you can see the Star Wars stuff where it's like, oh, it's this guy and he's, well, I guess, semi orphaned now. And he's in the desert, obviously the desert planet thing. Although if you want to go like I, I know someone on a podcast I listened to mentioned they're like, I've read the Bible. They're like, I, I know the, the son and the mother in the desert. <laughs> and I was like, all right, I can see how this probably there's some biblical stuff going on here, but it doesn't feel like it's just. It doesn't feel like it. Whatever inspiration the author had, it feels like it was what you know. He got a lot of things from a lot of different places, and so it com combines into an interesting thing. And then I also wondered because I don't know this exactly. Is there kind of like anything like racial within the book? Because obviously, you look at the Freeman and are primarily people of color. Right. You, know, you got Javier Bardem. You got Zendaya, <clears throat> and then uh, House of Trades seems to be you know somewhat diverse where i know you know not everyone and obviously jason momo was a major character there and then yeah. i mean the house uh harkonnen just seems like giant evil pale people <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> well, I, I don't know if i have a racial thing to yeah. really look at there um, but it, it's you know, the freeman being right the most diverse group is that part of the book or is that sure. something that's kind of added in certainly certainly the the idea of a savior showing up to be a savior is a part of the book. Now, yes. is, there, is there a racial thing or ethnic thing or, you know, I, I, I don't remember enough about it, but certainly the, the broader motif is the idea of the outsider savior. And I, I, yeah. I'm trying to remember one of the reviews I read of this, but this is actually kind of a common trope in storytelling where a savior from the outside world comes into the, into the tribal group and becomes like a super version of the tribal person or something like that. That becomes, yeah. that is its own kind of motif. And so we, we kind of saw that a little bit with Paul where he had this reaction to the spikes. So, you know, and that yeah, is right, getting yeah. like superpowers because of that kind of thing. Um, so that's definitely a part of the book. Um, I would say that if you're bothered by that, give it time because the author isn't just kind of giving you what you expect. It's, there's there's some nuance there that's working right. itself out. So, uh, so by by all means, you know, don't take this movie just at face value. Because um, yeah, I will say that I've I've generally in storytelling grown a little bit tired with like the one true chosen savior yes. type storytelling, which was one of the great things about, about the uh, second Star Wars movie, the uh, Last Jedi, where it was kind of like, hey, anyone could potentially rise up. Right. And be important. And then, you know, naturally they then walked all that back in the third right. movie. And, and that's why that movie's trash. Yeah. Call it the um, Rise of Star Walker. Yeah. Star Walker, not Rise of Anybody. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, I think it, it's an interesting dynamic where you have this wealthy white kid shows up to this plant, this desert right. planet with these people 
have had to deal with, you know, a bunch of people coming on their planet and just stealing resources. And these right. people are primarily people of color, whether it's, you know, black or Hispanic. And yeah, so that's kind of an interesting dynamic, especially in 2021 to have this wealthy white savior show up. Right. And I'm, and I, yeah, my, my understanding, obviously I was less than yours, but that it is a more complicated story than yes. just he shows up and it's great. Yeah, right. Uh, his, well, the other thing too is that, you know, kind of House of Trades is in this interesting position where it's like they want to work with the desert people, but they also still want to make the spice. So they're, they're, right. they, they're not even like unambiguous good guys. No, they they want to be more of a partnership, but yeah. it's still very much we have to get what we want out of this. Right. And they're still showing up. Right. You know, they're, right. Still they're not just like, hey, we'll leave you alone. It's your yeah. planet. Have yeah. fun, guys. <laughs> I uh, I was thinking about that an interesting plot device in this movie that has it where the the main character has to go to the journey like some some movies the journey is kind of forced on the character in other ones the character kind of shows up and like chooses it and I think in yeah. this one Paul it, it, it's kind of both I mean yeah he's he's a kid so he can't decide not to go somewhere but you know, it does involve him having to actually go to the desert planet. That, that, that's where the story is. He kind of goes to it, almost like destiny in, 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 in a way where it's the, this, this idea of going to a mysterious place and then having a mysterious journey um, where the setting is as mysterious as, you know, kind of the changes that are taking place within Paul. It's kind of this elaborate I don't know, motif of puberty, maybe, who knows? No, um, <laughs> I won't get into that. No, it, but I, I like that idea of, of this, uh, of the motif of going to a mysterious place and having mystery kind of be everywhere. And I thought, I'm, 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 I, I think I maybe even read this online. I'm not claiming to have thought this myself, but this idea that the desert is this perfect setting for this because in the desert, there's no trees, there's no forest. You can see as far as the eye can see. Mm. Everything is completely out in front of you. And really what you have to worry about with being misled is it with not being able to see things, but with mirages, with seeing what you want to see. Ooh. And so you have this, you have this aspect That's where deep, I like it. they show up in the desert. And of course, Paul's father, the, the king, I guess, or whatever he is, he's not confused by this. He knows full well we're being set up. We're being right. tricked by the emperor. We're being tricked by House uh, Harkonnen. We're going to go here anyways because we think that we're going to be able to turn the tide in our favor. Mm -hmm. So th this idea of vision in the desert that, that you can see out very far and see all the pieces, whereas Paul, Paul is different. Paul actually develops this gift of kind of seeing the future. Right. It's, it's, a, it's a fuzzy future. He's not quite sure what it means. He's not quite sure what it is. And so th th this idea of the desert being both completely completely open completely transparent but at the same time the perfect template for our own um, lack of prediction our own seeing what we want to see our own mirage is taking place i thought was a great use of setting for this for that storytelling device i, I, I love all of that and then i also like how uh you mentioned there's the like you kind of the ones where this, it just happens to the lead character or they seek it out Yes. And as far and as setting kind goes, of both in here, kind of both aspects. Yeah. But with and I think, yeah, you see that with his visions too, where he sees some of these visions and he doesn't like what he's seeing. And then uh, there, one of my favorite things, again, is the Bene Gesserit, where, you know, we find out that, you know, they've been selectively breeding to try and create this savior. And then they yes. also seem to be kind of implanting the savior narrative within. Yes. Like the Freeman and stuff. Yes, yes. Well, Which so I think they go to the part, planet. Yes. And then they yeah, come that part's super fascinating because I don't remember anything yeah. like this, like <laughs> in another story where no. you've got this, like, kind of basically group of witches who are have some sort of power here where they clearly have political power to some extent, which I hope we find out more about that. But he was not, I guess the ben, Bene Gesserit, they don't explicitly say this in the film, but my understanding now is that members of it can decide the sex of their child. Is that, okay. is that correct? Yeah, I think that, that sounds right. Or like they somehow have control over it or something. Because, yeah, yeah, because the idea was that, uh, again, his mother, Lady Jessica, played by Rebecca Ferguson, she decides because she loves the Duke to give him a son. 
right. to be kind of like the heir, which she was not supposed to do. He was yeah. not supposed to, because the, the savior, for, I guess, probably political reasons, has to be a male. And so they were, they've been selectively breeding women to then eventually lead up to this male savior. And she kind of bucks the timeline here. And he's resistant when he kind of, he's kind of figuring out that like, oh, I'm, I maybe am supposed to be the savior and I don't want to be because I see where it leads and I don't like yes. it. But he also doesn't b- become, because the danger when you do that is they can be too angsty, too resistant. And you're just like, you're just holding up the story. And I don't think he ever does that. I think the reluctance makes us like him more. Yeah. Because he's not like, I'm the savior. What up? He's right. kind of like, I see how terrible this will be. But then at a certain point, he's just kind of like, I have to accept this. This is what I need to do. And so I think they do a really good job balancing that within the story. Yeah, I, I think I think all that's correct. And I think, you know, the the power that the Bene Gesserit have is its own mystery. You're, what do they really control? I mean, who, where, where right. what is their it? end goal, too, which right. is also not entirely clear. And um, it, yeah, it's it's it's. Uh, it's, you know, is, is there really magic in the movie or is it some weird kind of like subtle technique or something? I mean, there, there's yeah. all these nice, it's, it's not, you know, kind of like the corny Harry Potter magic or something. It's more <laughs> subtle. It's this idea of like, I, again, you wouldn't say realistic, but it's almost, it, it doesn't feel childish. You know, what I, my, my favorite part about Dune mm-hmm. is that when I was reading the book and my, and my favorite part about the movie is that when I was reading the book, I had in my head an idea of what this would look like. And what I most appreciated about the movie is that the director, it, it, it is as if he didn't pull any punches. It was a dark, very, uh, very gritty environment. There's a lot of violence in it. Uh, the Sardaukar planet is frightening. The scenery on that planet is frightening. Uh, Baron Harkonnen, looks like this evil monster you know yeah. nothing felt childish. <laughs> everything about it felt mature and dark and i really like that because i think um i think that tone is the most appropriate tone for Yeah, because this movie is pg-13 but it's not like pg-13 where well, like a lot of like the marvel stuff or yes even some of like the jurassic park movies to a degree where you're trying to like build up like oh this is a fun family movie like if your kid's not at least in middle school, there's, I don't think there's any point <laughs> to show no. them this movie. No. Like, the, no eight-year-old, I mean, maybe some eight-year-old's going to like the couple of fight scenes, but they're not going to have any clue what's going on. Like, this movie is very much like, this is teen and up entertainment. We're yeah. not going to, yeah, we're not trying to kidify any of this. We're not, like you said, they're not overly going to explain things. Um, again, even with the Benny Gesserit, with the, the voice power that they have. Right. We're just thrown into that where she's like telling him to use the voice. And we're like, what the fuck is that? <laughs> yes. And, and then you find out. Right, exactly. And uh, yeah, I think, you know, certainly what is nice about this movie is that, uh, you know, maybe in the first half, you would you would have liked to have seen more powerful uh people of color characters although i think javier bardem is pretty powerful in, in the I, film he's, he's great in the, the scenes he has in this movie but certainly there are plenty of powerful women in the film i mean the Bene Gesserit are wield all sorts of power that we don't even know about and they're very prominent in kind of driving the story of it so i think i think this movie on the surface is oh white guy saves the day but you realize very early on, no, it's it's uh, it's obviously much more than that going on. It's not simple. I would, you know, one movie or one thing I like about Dune as a book, and as I think the movie as well, is that it's complicated. You, it, there's a lot. Yeah, going there's on a lot there. going on. Absolutely. And I think it takes a lot to do that well. And uh, yes, I I I really enjoyed it. If I haven't made that point clear enough, uh, I, I really enjoyed it. I thought the author did a, or the director, director did a good job capturing the book. And I also really enjoyed the story. I think it has a lot of interesting elements to it that are very original. And uh, yeah, I mean, I'm very excited to see part two. Hopefully it comes out sooner rather than later, although I, I'm not sure when to expect it. <laughs> <laughs> so a couple of quick things just uh, on the more periphery end of, of things. Um, how did you feel about the fighting? Because it, for people who, uh, hopefully, again, if you're listening to this this far, you've seen it. But 
you know, they all have like these force fields that they can turn on. Yes. And so, you know, you can stab someone through the force field, but you kind of have to like slow down to like yes. get through it. And like on the one hand, it's like pretty cool to see because it's not right. like something I've seen before. But I was talking to a friend and he was kind of like, it kind of lacked the visceral quality of other fights that you would see in movies because of that. And I was like, I do kind of see that at the same time where like I enjoyed it, but also, you know, it does lack some of that. I, obviously it helps in keeping it PG-13 that well, Jason Momoa is not just that slicing dude's necks and blood shooting out. But yeah, how did you feel about the, the fight scenes? I, I don't know that the PG-13 category should exist in film. I, I think it's, <laughs> it's always a complete fucking waste. I think any, any you movie... Can blame, uh, you can blame Temple of Doom for that. They invented the PG-13 rating for Temple of Doom. Yeah. Find me a PG-13 movie that you wouldn't wish were actually R. And I think Dune is a perfect example of this, where I, I, I think a rated R Dune with better fight scenes and better, you know, quality to it like i like like i mentioned before when you meet the uh emperor military the the sardaukar on their planet it's dark they're like getting blood smeared on him like what the hell is going on <laughs> so that is a great scene that, that it is that may be the most impressive like one of the most impressive visual scenes in the movie where in like 30 seconds you know everything you need to know about this military from just the brutality of their planet um it's always exciting or it's always interesting to see how movies in the future justify sword fighting. Star Wars had to justify right. sword fighting. Dune had to justify sword fighting. Um, it's always interesting when they, when they go that route. Um, the first Dune, the first Dune movie, if you look at the force fields, it looks fucking ridiculous. I, I would imagine. It looks completely fucking stupid. This movie does a better job, although if I had one part of the movie that felt corny to me, it would be mm. how they portrayed the force fields, kind of like blurry blue halo over here. Right. Eh, that would took me out of it just a little bit. Um, the fighting could have, you know, you, you can always make fighting more brutal, you can always make fighting more graphic. Um, there's actually very little fighting in the movie. No, you, yeah, there, there's only a couple scenes, really. And so, um, so, yeah, to, to, to see that better done, yeah, of, of course, but it, it's such a small part of it. You know, it'd be like one thing, it's like, if John Wick messed up the choreography, that'd be a big fucking deal. It's like the whole movie is fighting. <laughs> you have to get the fighting right, John Wick. What was the point of this? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Like, why am I here? Um, with, with Dune, I think that they were limited by the PG-13, and so it's hard for me to be too critical of it. Um, and, and kind of, yeah, their explanation for Force goes to that, essentially bullets or lasers would move too fast basically the the force field blocks things that move quickly and so the yeah. idea with the sword is like a sword is moving slowly enough that you can it can get through the force field you know that's just kind of again how they explain away having you fight with swords instead of a gun in the future is yet right. to have some kind of mythology around that um but uh you know i i thought the uh the the knife fighting with the fremen i thought was actually was actually pretty good with Paul at the end, yeah. I mean, when he's fighting him on the end, I thought that one went, that one went pretty well. Um, and then I, I thought also kind of the the scale of the the Armada assault on the Atreides mm. palace was, was good impressive. Well. So, um, so yeah, I, the the one or two sword fights were yeah, it was you know it was uh, Jason Momoa's character fighting. Yeah, yeah, sure, a little weak on that. But the other fight scenes, I thought more than made up for it in terms of you know scale and you know kind of this idea yeah. of this this idea that uh of elegance being a part of fighting which is it's something i probably don't like because it kind of glorifies a little bit which i uh, obviously have a problem with but i think i think it fit well with the story of fighting being it's almost this idea of chivalry with paul and this fremen who fight essentially challenging each other for ruling the group basically is what it comes down to yeah. and the idea of like a duel and everything else um and Paul, Paul not really being able to back out of it. Like, I think Paul had to fight is from what I remember. Right. Plot point. So kind of interesting there as well. But um, the, the, the use of fighting in, in, the, in the movie is well done. That the choreography could use some work. Sure. But luckily for anybody hearing this, it's such a small part of it. It's really not that big of a deal. 
And I will say, well, one of my big disappointments, which I don't, can't really blame the movie for because they're following a story that already existed. But so far as that lack of fighting goes, just as a, a movie fan, it was disappointing to have Dave Bautista on one side and then you right. have Jason Momoa and Josh Brolin on the other side. And Dave Bautista never fights either of them. And it's no. like, come on, give me what, I'm, what I want. No, it's only part one. It's only part one. I was gonna say one of those still has the potential to happen in part yeah. two, so yeah. fingers crossed we're gonna see it. But that was a little disappointing for me because Dave Bautista really doesn't do much in this movie. I no. was kind of no. surprised too. No. So I assume we'll see more in uh, round two. No, I that that was the most surprising thing to me was how little we see of Dave Bautista in the whole film, like maybe a minute really like all of his screen time in total like it's really not much at all <laughs> that, that was also obviously we're, we're now recording this at a point where we know that dune part two is going going to be made yeah yeah but that, that was always kind of the sign that uh unless it was a catastrophic bomb dune part two was going to happen because otherwise why did dave batista sign on for this why right and sign on for this like you don't sign on for this unless you're like, all right, there's going to be another movie where my part will be much bigger. Yes. And probably even beyond that of a franchise of. Yeah, I believe other books. there is going to be an HBO uh, like miniseries that I Dune the Sisterhood. Which oh. I believe will follow the Bene Gesserit more. Very good. Very good. Well, anything else for 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 Dune? But like I said, like even as someone who felt like it told an incomplete story, which obviously in part it did, it's still absolutely worth watching. And again, if you can see it in theaters, because this is the type of, you know, this is the type of story that you want to see on the big screen, because it's just it's going to be better if you see it that way. I could not agree more. And yes, more than lived up to my expectations from the book. And I'm excited for part two as well. And, and if you cannot see it in theaters, I will add, you can watch it on, on HBO. Yeah, HBO Max. Max, yes. So no excuse to not see it. I Absolutely. would give it an A. Uh, yeah, so uh, I, I think that's probably right. You give it an A, I give it a B. And I think most people who watch it will probably end up somewhere in between. But, yeah, yeah. And then obviously, if I'm giving recommendations for other movies to see, if you haven't seen the other Denis Villeneuve movies, yeah, yeah, go watch those ones. I mean, Blade Runner twenty forty nine and Arrival, especially since they are also sci fi films. Those are two of the best. You could argue those are the two best sci fi films of the twenty tens. And I'd be like, sure, they're they're they're. And I would say probably, I would pick Arrival of the two of those. I think I would too. Yeah, but I, I loved both of those. Yeah. Both. I think if I was grading those, those are like. A, at least both a minuses for me yeah yeah those are those are fantastic films uh and in in blade runner 2049 certainly demonstrates his world building abilities so and blade runner 2049 also has some uh fun stuff that it does with the uh messiah type oh yeah stuff, right which that's actually one of my favorite kind of subversions of that that i've seen in storytelling recently yeah, that was that was great. That was a great movie. Um, yes, be sure to check out his other works because I don't think he's made a bad movie yet. No, not that I've seen. Very good. Well, if you enjoyed our conversation earlier about totalitarianism, check out Hannah Arnett's book, Origins of Totalitarianism. Also check out Tim Snyder. Some of the things I was talking about earlier about kind of Hitler seeing things through the race war perspective. Uh, Timothy Snyder has written at least one book on maybe two books on um and i've enjoyed listening to him online some of what i said today came from him as well check out dune it's a great movie um don't be an ideologue don't be a bigot don't be a racist anything else you want to add to that list Joe? no no i'm with you Just ch <laughs> challenge your beliefs whatever they are always challenge your beliefs and don't watch video drone with your parents <laughs> um those are the main takeaways from today's it's episode definitely Hello. Us, Roses and Rhetoric, on Twitter and Instagram at Roses underscore Rhetoric. Follow Joe at Jose4 underscore Squarevo on Instagram and Twitter. And you can follow Joe Matz. Joe, where can people find you at? Uh, at Joe E. Matz. So that's Joe, then an E, Matz, M-A-T-Z, on Twitter. And then uh, if you like 
fantasy football or regular football, I have podcasts on the IB network on Spotify, Apple, I think any podcast network, you can find it there. Very good. Hopefully this episode loads up properly. Apologize for internet today. Um, anyways, we'll see you all next week. We enjoy you uh, joining us for this. Until next time, I'm Jimmy Hackett signing off for Joseph Matt saying ciao.